Welcome to another episode of the Epwazi Wine Buzz. Today's guest is an extraordinary person who has dedicated not a small, not even a medium, but a lengthy period, a substantial period of his life devoted to a specific area and to the art of winemaking. Today, we are meeting what I would say is a Renaissance man who has been described as a winemaker, viticulturalist, writer, and artist. But I think he's so much more. And join us for this episode and learn a little bit more. And you, you will see what this is going to be all about. So welcome to the show, Richard Olson Hobbick. Thank you very much for joining us, Richard. Thank you for having me, Dr. Lee. It's a pleasure. Richard, tell us about the Richard Olson Hobbick. The Richard, not the one that we read about on the internet, but the real you. And perhaps the three real things. Me. Sorry? The real me. Yeah, you know, three things that many people wouldn't know about you. Well, um, I have uh, been married for 40 years to my college sweetheart, Nancy. Uh, I have two great children who are now, I call them kids, but they're in their 30s. So, um, but I'm also an amateur musician. Oh. Uh, I played drums, guitar, and also a five-string banjo, uh, which I haven't played for a while, so I'm not sure I could get back into it as good as I used to be, but mm -hmm. uh, I do also love music and uh, have dabbled in that area for, for years. Um, I'm, I'm a cat daddy. I have a very nice, beautiful little French chartreuse named Sylvie. Oh. And uh, uh, I love life. Well, you know, that philosophy, having gone through the life that you have with a with beautiful lady of your life from college days, you are truly blessed. And I, 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 I so would concur, when you have uh, children, they're always children, no matter how old they are. And I think any That's parent true. would attest to that. Yes. Well, Richard, your last name, tell us about that. It's a double my wife, Yeah, uh, it's hyphenated. And, and my wife was the Olsen. I was the Harvick. Uh, my okay. name comes from uh, the uh, area which is now in the Czech Republic. But when my uh, ancestors were there, it was the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. Ah. And uh, also the independent uh, Margrave of Moravia. Uh, so they've been there for a very long time. And the Olsen is uh, Norwegian, which is my wife's heritage. And we've always had a very equal partnership since since we met. And we decided that it could it would be interesting to combine the names. And uh, that's kind of been the story of how our relationship has has been. So that's where it comes from. Well, thank you for sharing that. And and I would say that 40 years ago, that's very forward thinking. It's quite common now, but I don't think it was 40 years ago. It was ago. not. It was did not. You, did you get a lot of uh, sort of uh, shadowy looks and, oh, really? You put both your, your, your names together? Uh, I mean, that, yeah, back in the day, topic we did. of conversation. Yeah, back in the day, and some of the questions were, well, what are your children going to do when they get married? Are they going to add another name to that? Um, we don't get that too much anymore, because as you said, there's a lot of um, hyphenated names. And I mean, it goes back to um, Latin uh, culture uh, for a while now that there were uh, a number of last names taken. But yeah, it was it was a uh, a little bit out of the box at the time, but I'm really glad we did it. And now my children are really happy we did it too, I believe, because it's it's different and I think it gives them some individuality. Certainly, certainly in this, um, in the world that we're living to and living in right now, it's uh, very, very important. 
that we can identify where we're from and how how uh, those names came about. And you know, Richard, you you um, have really had a very interesting life, and perhaps you can share with us, you know, in our audience out here, you know, your purposeful journey into winemaking. How did that begin? Yeah, I, you know, as as long as I can remember, when I was a child, I wanted to be outside, and I wanted to be with nature and i was interested in how things grow how nature is living and i was not born in in the country like a lot of people who are getting in who have gotten into the wine industry in the u.s uh, i was not born uh in a vineyard in a basket between the rows uh i came to it um and so as I got older, I, I was constantly drawn to uh, the outdoors, to the environment. Um, I never felt that I wanted to put on a suit and tie and, and take a train into New York City to, to work in an office mm -hmm. or on Wall Street or whatever. A lot of people, a lot of uh, my friends that were, were doing. And... In fact, in my high school yearbook, I had put down when you have your picture, they ask you what you think you want to be. And I put farmer, which drove my mother crazy because to her, she thought that was not why they were sending me to school and what they were not expecting. Um, since then, um, they got, uh, I think, very happy with my career choice. Well, I think it was a little more focused, perhaps, wouldn't you say? I mean, you went to for sure. from Cornell, you you did your viticultural course there. And, yes. Uh, it was more focused, though. I think you're being uh, very modest there, Richard, apart from wanting to enjoy the sun and the wind. Yes, yes. Well, I, you know, I started my, my academic studies in, in agronomy. Mm -hmm. So it was soil science, it was agricultural science. And while I was at Cornell... Uh, being in the Finger Lakes, being so close to the wine industry there, um, I recognized and started to look at what was going on. And it just clicked for me. Mm -hmm. um, I was not in a household that served a lot of wine necessarily. We had it at holidays and at special, uh, when special company came over. Um, even so, my mother was born in a wine region in Germany called the Na. Yes. And uh, the house which she was born in was surrounded by hillsides of vines. Um, my grandfather and my, my father was born in New York City. However, his father had come over from Austria in 1912. And uh, eventually was in the restaurant business, a tavern, which mm -hmm. then subsequently became a speakeasy during the 20s. And he did that for the entire decade of the 20s, running an illegal alcohol operation, essentially, uh, at a small tavern. And I'm sure so, there's a lot of stories there to tell. That's my next book. Episode. Yes. <laughs> that is my next book, in fact. So yeah, there's some in my veins. Um, and, uh, it seems that, uh, all of that kind of clicked together for me. And I just felt attracted to the, the process of making wine, the, the, the skill and the techniques used to grow grapevines, to make wine. And I just grabbed hold of it and drilled into it as, as much as I possibly could. And, uh, here I am. Well, I think and the I... Wine community in, in that region should be extremely appreciative and thankful that uh, in more ways than one, you have the uh, the vine sort of DNA within you, you know, from, from, from your mother's side. And uh, for our audience who are, who are not aware, you know, the Fingers Lake um, 
wine region is a significant region. It may not be exceptionally large in comparison to the, the mammoth powerhouses and vineyards of Italy or France, but they are significant. And that's where that leads me to my next question, Richard. What do you think drove you to produce these great wines? Because it's not an easy climate that you have there. No, it's not. When I, I mean, this industry is only on the North Fork, on the east end of Long Island, we're only 50 years old. Yeah. So we're a baby compared to um, the great regions of the world and even California for that matter. Um, but we've been blessed with uh, a climate and soil structure that allows us to grow the famous grapes of Europe, the mm -hmm. vinifera grapes um, that have um, made the most famous wines around the world. Mm -hmm. um, so in the late 70s, early 80s, um, it's when is when the, the region started to get developed. Um, prior to us doing so, there were very few vinifera growing in on the East Coast. I would say Virginia was starting at a similar time. Mm -hmm. But many people were not convinced that we could grow these noble grapes of Europe in our East Coast climate. Um, it took a lot of private trial and error, essentially. Um, even the university research uh, uh, being done and the extension systems that were along the East Coast would not recommend planting things like Chardonnay or Pinot Noir or any of the famous European varieties. The industry at that time was really focused on Native American grapes and hybrids. Mm -hmm. That's where New York had, had been for quite some time. Um, so we have made our reputation on the North Fork in particular from being able to grow these grapes, particularly the famous red grapes from Bordeaux, the Merlot, the Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, and Malbec, Petit mm -hmm. Verdot, the big five, if you will, um, and do so successfully. Um, and that continues today. Those are really the wines that are the stars of the region. Um, so I feel blessed to be able to work in a place that can produce these kinds of wines. And it's really about the, the ability of the vines in our climate to succeed. Um, and it was this confluence of events that took place basically because of the surrounding waters that are all around us, the Long Island Sound, the Atlantic Ocean, and in between the two forks of the East End, the Peconic Bay. Mm -hmm. And so we have sometimes a 220 day growing season. We don't have very, very cold, low winter temperatures that can hurt uh, these vines. Um, and uh, we have a, a steady amount of wind pretty much every day of the year that can help reduce the disease pressure from humidity, which we do have. Um, cool. um, and the soils are extremely well drained. So even though we do get rain and we get enough of it to make any winemaker on the West Coast's head spin, uh, the soil is dry and drained very quickly after these precipitation events. So being so, a fellow winemaker, obviously, um, you know, hiding in the, the shadow of your brilliance there, Richard, but no. nevertheless, I appreciate having good soil, weather, wind, as you mentioned, to, it minimizes the prospects of disease, certainly, um when, when you're having that flow through and of course the grape variety itself but yes there's got to be more I, I mean most of the wineries are in the north fork of long island right. and right. Uh, you know when when we talk about uh, bordeaux we might say you know cabernet sauvignon we talk about 
Piemont, you know, we'll talk about, you know, the Barolo we'll, and every major region and Germany, Riesling, they seem to have their signature grape. You've been one of the pillars uh, setting up the North Fork, you know, the uh, of Long Island. What, what do you consider to be the uh, signature grape? And, and, and I'm, I know that there was a great Merlot, but let's hear your side of it. Well, I think uh, years ago, Merlot was what we focused on, and I think we tried to grab onto and 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 put forward as our signature. Mm -hmm. However, I I think, as in Bordeaux, there is not one single grape making those wines, uh, and I believe the same is true here. There is more complexity there's more interesting wines being made from the combination of either merlot or cabernet franc cab sauvignon or petit verdot etc um, to create something greater than the individual wines themselves um, it's a it's a bit of a a delicate dance because varietal wines are king in the u.s and blends not so much um and i think some merlot growers were scared off by the sideways blowback yes that happened um and that was a period of time where many growers started to look at other varieties that could also grow here so we have we have been blessed in that lots of different things seem to grow can be grown in this area. Um, and I think different than say the Finger Lakes and, and Riesling because it's much more difficult to grow a larger variety, especially of reds in the Finger Lakes that will consistently produce and consistently survive those cold winters. Um, so while we are blessed with this climate and this soil, it does make it things a little more complicated in narrowing it down. I think it will eventually happen. It's still early days. But for me right now, I would have to pick Cabernet Franc as the red and Sauvignon Blanc as the white. That are our two, I think, most compelling wines that we make. Simply and you, because you'll see that in the years ahead, will will your successes, you know, also follow that path? You feel uh, remains to be seen. I I'd hope so because uh, growing lots of different things is great for um, direct marketing mm -hmm. at the winery. Um, there's a little bit of push and pull with that issue because um wineries obviously have to sell the wine that they're making in order to survive um and so there's a little bit of a, a some tension between direct sales through tasting rooms and the greater wine marketplace uh, that 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 is out there especially for us it's manhattan which is really in the center of the wine buying universe in this country every wine in the world is available in manhattan and um i think it's still evolving yeah i think but so but right right now i, I would i would pick those two okay. as having the, the best affinity making the best wines year in and year out uh with the least amount of fiddling by winemakers they can just bloom and grow um, in the bottle to be beautiful representations of what we do. You know, what was very interesting for me when I was uh, reading through your book was the aspect that most wine regions or any industry to be successful, there must be what we call a cluster effect in the sense that the supporting industries in order for in this particular case, the wineries, to be able to focus on making the wine. So you have to have the um, 
the suppliers of, of the yeast, the containers, the corks, uh, the staffing, uh, the skilled labor. And North Fork, that region, it's not huge by any means. How, no. how do you cope with this? And, and how does that reflect on the prices? Well, it, it can, um, especially as, as we all know, labor is getting more expensive. Materials are becoming more expensive. Uh, we had looked into the, trying to pool together resources, and we do at, at different times, especially with vineyard supplies. Yes. We uh, cooperatively can purchase posts and wire, uh, and sometimes plants uh, with, with wineries. Um, sometimes it is, uh, possible to, to coordinate, um, a purchase of a, a particular bottle, uh, with another winery, but for the most part, okay. like a sort of cooperative. In it a way. Yeah. I'd say in the most, for the most part, that's not happening for most companies because we're just overall not big enough. We're only 2,500 acres, 26, give and take, 100 acres, um, you know, which is, you know, one large California vineyard. Oh, yeah. Um, so, um, yeah. So do you, think, costs, do you think, given the, the, the small scale of economies that you have there, that the region will still be able to in the face of all these increasing costs, still be around in, say, 20 years? It should be, because it's so special. And as long as the wine can keep getting better and better, which I believe it can, um, oh. it will have a market, and it will create, um, the interest will, will grow. Because the types of wines that we're making are, are very unique for the U.S., um, where most people are looking at American wine and describing American wine as a West Coast product. And that's that's where the definition has, has derived from. When I was selling wine in the early 80s, I was mm -hmm. selling a, a Chardonnay uh, at one of the first wineries I worked at in New York City. And um, at that point... Everybody wanted a lot of oak, a lot of sweetness, uh, alcohol, right. power, and syrupy Chardonnays. And that's exactly what we didn't do. Um, we were making essentially crisp, lively, um, Chablis-like, if you will, styles of white wine out of Chardonnay. Um, it's a... Uh, yeah. Times have changed. How times have times changed. Times have changed, for sure. Now, yeah. Richard, you happened by fate to be in the proximity, you know, in the North Fork of Long Island, and you made wine there for 40 plus years. Do you think if by life's chance you were born in Bordeaux or in one of the major Italian wine regions or Piemont, would you still be making wine as a career? And why? I think that's a great question. No one's ever asked me that before. Um, and I think I would, because it feels like it's something that's inside of me that at this point in time, I I don't know what it's like to not do it. Um, in fact, my, my father, who was um, in the at that point in time, Czechoslovakia in Moravia, mm -hmm. he was uh, um, expelled after the Second World War mm -hmm. because he was a German speaker. And um, he often joked about the fact that if he was still there, if, he, if that never happened, that we would right. all be living over there. And I think, yeah, I would probably do that. I don't think my interests would have changed. I don't think I'd want to be uh, taking the train to Prague to go to work in an office. I would probably right. still want to be doing what I'm doing. Enjoying what nature offers best. And in most cases for free, for free. Yeah. Working and working with my hands, being yeah. active, 
uh, and I've always I've always been a creative person. Um, so yeah, that really what attracted me to the to the profession was the the combination of of um, being able to work with my hands outdoors and yet have this beautiful product that, that can be enjoyed by so many people. Okay. And I've always been a perfectionist. So everything that I do, I want to be the best I can possibly be at it. Talking about the perfection, Richard, being a winemaker, you it requires sort of crucial characteristics to succeed. Apart from the obvious, you know, being able to handle stress when you have to, when you are going through a stuck fermentation and for the audience, that means when a fermentation has begun and then for several reasons or even unknown, that fermentation stops. You then have to restart that. So the perseverance, the patience, what other characteristics do you think are needed for a winemaker? And what would you share with the new winemakers who are beginning their career? Well, you need to love what you do. And if and you and you need to be not afraid of, of hard work. Uh and it and, is hard. <laughs> and it is hard. And it's nothing you want to do if you want to make a lot of money. Because there are other professions you can get into with less physical work that would pay you more money. So it's really it's really something you you have to feel, you have to love, you have to be interested in. And um, I would say the most important part for me is to learn about the vine first. Learn about what the vines need, how they grow, what are their requirements, uh, how they can fit in, into the soil and climate and the site that you have. Um, as I said earlier, most people who get into the wine business in in our country are not coming from wine growing families. They're business people, they're doctors, they're lawyers, they're in advertising, any number of professions. I think that's classic, Richard. You know, you have the story of the lawyer or the doctor as all these career driven individuals who think that, oh, I'm just going to sit back on the on the on the patio and watch the grapes grow by themselves. But right. that, that is anything but the truth. Uh, it requires yeah. an enormous amount of hard work, not only mentally, but physically. I, I couldn't agree more with you. Yeah, uh, well, we need we need these people because they they need us. So they need us, or we need them. What? What? Which one? Yeah. Or do you think it's an equal balance, Richard? It is a you know it's a it's a collaborative effort. Let's say, I mean, there are a lot of people that have the money to do this, but maybe not the know how. That's and that's cool. true in a lot of a lot of uh, uh, business. Uh, so it does provide, at least for me, has provided me the ability to do what I love to do because I certainly would not be able to afford starting a company um, from scratch with uh, the resources I had available. So there's people that can capitalize and there's people that are um, able to carry out. Um, it really is well, a, a labor of love. It really is. It really is. So, Richard, talking about the, the four plus decades that you have been making wine, share with us what was the most agonizing moment and experience for you in those years of winemaking? Uh, that is a, a very easy one for me to, to, to think about because it was the winter of 1984. Okay. When I was working in the town of Bridgehampton, which is on the southern fork of Long Island, it's also known as the Hamptons. And uh, famous. I was working for uh, uh, a company that was the second wine 
wine producer on Long Island called the Bridge Hampton Winery. And I was hired right out of college by the owner whose name was Lyle Greenfield, a wonderful man who I'm still close with, um, who was the classic, had some capital, but didn't know how to carry it out. But had and a so, vision, okay. Had mm -hmm. a vision, had a great vision. And uh, <clears throat> so I was managing the vineyard there. I started in 1983, managing the vineyard and making the wine. It was very small at the time. Mm -hmm. um, early days of, of Long Island. And um, the vineyard was in very tough shape when I arrived, um, mm -hmm. basically right out of college. And my friends were very jealous because I was working in the Hamptons and they thought I must be clubbing or going out and partying every day. But basically I was working a hundred hours a week and didn't go anywhere. Um, trying to get this vineyard back in shape, which we were able to do. Um, and in 1984, the following winter, uh, we had minus 12 degrees Fahrenheit on this site. And I remember looking at the thermometer. It was a very still, quiet, cold night. And in the morning, I got a call from a friend of mine who said, do you know what temperature it was last night? And I said, well, I'm afraid to ask. But he said, they, they've got minus 12. And uh, so long story short, the entire vineyard was was basically killed by winter temperature. Yes, sir. And, and we had to start from scratch, <laughs> allow them to regrow again. And that was that was a, that was a tough one. And it took oh. another couple of years to really even get back to production. Well, thank you for sharing that, unfortunately. <laughs> Many uh, wine wineries in uh, the Okanagan. Uh, this January, there was a equally horrific uh, cold snap between fifty mm. to twenty degrees, and uh, they estimate ninety five percent of this year's harvest will not materialize, and some of those vines will, are are dead. So I, I can appreciate what oh, that's anguish, terrible. What anguish you went through. But now talk from, let's move from the down to the up. How about what what was the uh, most exhilarating experience for you in the last you know four decades of making wine? Well, this is good because I've only come up with one terrible experience, but there's been a lot of exhilarating experiences. Great. And um I get exhilarated every harvest, really. It's like uh, the it's it's like the show is showtime, you know. It's every all the work for the year kind of comes together, and and we are get the dopamine, endorphins, serotonin. Yeah, yeah. it's just yeah. exciting, you know, and um, a new beginning, you know, so much potential, uh, and the culmination of so many people's work up to that time. Um, Probably my first vintage at Bedell was one of the most exhilarating vintages and times for me because it was 2010 and that particular vintage was the most extraordinary, perfect vintage that I've ever experienced still. It was sunny, it was hot, it was beautiful, it was warm, dry, humidity was low and we just coasted right into the fall with the same beautiful. weather. And we have made just the most beautiful wines that we really, I, I don't think we've quite matched that particular vintage yet. Marvelous. Um, um, probably the other one is the uh, 2013 Obama inaugural luncheon, which we were asked to provide a wine for. Mm -hmm. So that was that. very, very exciting. And, and a lot of press was surrounding us and um, really helped put our region uh, in the forefront for the public to see. 
uh, both New York Sometimes and London. it needs that. Sometimes it needs that sort of publicity. Yeah. Yes, so for talk sure. Talking about the changes, you know, technology has changed over the decades. And certainly when it comes to winemaking, Richard, it's no different. Uh, right. You know, we, you know, I often come across when visiting other wineries where they are using remote control uh, in order to maintain the temperature, you know, on, on, on their vats. Um, it, there's all sort of different technology that is now being applied from the optical scanner for the type of grapes that they are putting into the, into the actual moose. So for, do you think technology for the better or detriment? I Your think it's like, I think the technology in wine is like the technology that we have in all of our lives. Um, some of it creates good things and some of it creates bad things, just like smartphone technology. Mm -hmm. It's great. I'm, I'm here speaking with you. Um, but it causes some problems, especially with children and um, and sometimes with political discourse, et cetera, we all see it. TV was another example back in the day when people were, you know, vilifying TV, yet it got so much information into people's homes. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's the same with wine. That there's There's been some good things that have been provided by technology, like uh, vine breeding, vineyard equipment, mm -hmm. um, for example, there's a UV sprayer that's going to be um, hitting the market pretty soon, which does not use any fungicide material at all. Mm. Um, um, but um, wine testing equipment is a case in point. Um, there's there's equipment now that makes testing the components of wine so much easier and faster. Um, the Sentia. SO2 uh, tester, for example, which is a strip of paper you put into the, the side of the machine, which is about the size of a smartphone. Mm. And within 15 seconds, you have the SO2 value uh, level in your wine. Wow, that's really um, important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and prior to that, it would take about 15 minutes for us to actually make that, complete that test. Um, at the same time, it has created some disconnect between terroir and the, the the close connection to the land that smaller wineries, uh, for the most part, can still have. Um, right. So uh, I think it's a mixed bag. For me, I'm not one for a lot of fancy gadgets. Um, my cellar is pretty basic. I use a plate and frame filter that's been around for about 75, 80 years. <laughs> okay. uh, I have, I use a piston must pump that is, it was made in 1980. Uh, I'm very old fashioned that way because I believe that the wine quality is determined by the vineyard and we're just the caretakers. Yeah. So, but I understand for large, large wineries who are producing millions of gallons, uh, they're going to need some better tools to get there. So, yeah, I don't know if it's one or the other, but I think it's a mixed bag, like like most technology can be. You know, talking about technology, before I move on from this topic, Richard, you know, micro-oxygenation and, uh, you know, all the different uh, types of now they're even using drones. Now they're using infrared to to look at the ripeness yeah. of the grape, and, yeah. and and certainly more in the new world, more in the new world. Even the winemaking process, the additives you allowed. I mean, we know certainly. I'm, I'm assuming not not where you are, but uh, I think it's called a mega purple. Uh, is yes. that they use mega purple? Sure. Yeah, yeah, like like they're using that for coloring and that. So there's often this question, winemaking today, it's more of a chemistry or is it still affected by terroir? I think the best wines are still affected by terroir and allow the terroir to show through. Um, 
I think there's two things going on at once, for sure. We have a lot of larger companies. If I was a grower with 1,500, 2,000 acres of vines, I can't possibly drive or walk through no. all of that and, and get be able to assess what's really going on. So I can see why they would want to use something like a drone to see what's happening. For me, and for a smaller company, I can walk our vineyard within a, a couple of hours and find out what's happening. Um, so chemistry is important. Um, Winemaking involves some, some chemical reactions that I think it's important to understand, but I don't think it should drive the process for uh, if you want to make terroir-driven wines. Um, you mentioned before about a stuck fermentation. And my my philosophy at this point in my winemaking uh, journey is if a wine is stuck, that means it's done. And we let it be. And so okay. we have some some wines that have maybe a little more residual sugar than we thought we were going to have when we started. But I found the process of trying to restart and heat up and activate through additional yeast is is more detrimental than the actual than leaving the wine alone and just letting it be who it wants to be so far i've been lucky to get away with that well that certainly is a different perspective and thanks for sharing that one richard um who knows what that will taste like but one thing we do know about is we've tasted life you know we've seen the seasons right. we've seen variances, how climate affects everything. Now, taking that right. to be an analogy of life, okay? Yes. What advice would you like to share with those about wine and about life itself, your personal philosophy? Because you've there seen are, it face up. You've yeah. seen it face up every year, the different vintages and the effects of the changes. Yeah. It, it is similar to life um, in so many ways. I mean, terroir exists in wine production and wine growing, but it also exists in our own lives. Yeah. Uh, and I use this analogy when I when I when I talk to people about it because there's a sector, like a lot of things, there's a sector that people don't believe terroir is actually a real thing, mm -hmm. and it to me. It's just a part of the essence of life. It's mm -hmm. actually wrapped up in evolution. Um, and people are affected by terroir. Uh, we all have come from similar ancestors, and yet we have migrated to different parts of the world to become a little bit different, even though genetically we're all basically identical twins. Um, so whether it's language or customs or skin color or religion or the types of clothes we wear, the types of food we eat, mm -hmm. uh, the way we react to our environment is all about terroir, human terroir. And it's same is true for vines. Um, uh, in my book, I have a chapter about how winemaking is... And, and grapes in a vineyard are similar to uh, raising a child because they both need nurturing. They need a lot of attention early in their lives, early intervention, if you will, to be able to grow strong and healthy in their later years. And it's similar to a vineyard. Um, if you don't take care of that vine that you put in the ground, it's going to take a lot longer for that vine to develop and maybe not even develop sure. up to its potential. So, yeah, there, there's a lot of that. And there's also a lot in winemaking and grape growing that we cannot control completely. And that's also true of our lives sometimes. And so all we can do is be the best kind of person we can be in our life, no matter what the conditions are no matter where we are yes um, Why? and try to put our best foot forward and the same is true for 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 making wine and, and growing grapes 
Wise words, Richard, wise words. Now, if you could select three wine pairings with food, what would those pairings be for you, Richard? Because I'm sure those lips have tried <laughs> an enormous amount of wines from all over the world. So with your discerning taste. Well, that's a hard question, you know, because there's, I've always been of the belief that pairing wine is a very individual personal decision. Yes, it is. Uh, you know, it's kind of like music when you're sitting around with different people. What do you want to listen to right now? And mm -hmm. you might get five or six different opinions, completely different genres of music. And I think it's it's somewhat like that with wine. But for me, if I had to pick and choose, yes. I think um, one of my personal favorites is is a is a local roast duck with a, a one of our Cabernet Francs. Duck like and crisp, okay. crispy, crispy duck. Um, I love lobster with Sauvignon Blanc. I the the kind of fatty buttery aspect of the lobster and the you know kind of vibrant acidity of Sauvignon Blanc is a great combination. Mm -hmm. And going back to my roots. Growing up, my mom would make sauerbraten on holidays, and they'd always serve a like a, a sweeter German wine that they smuggled home in a suitcase from one of their trips. And okay. that combination is a is a weird one because you've got this sour kind of meat, and then these different vegetables, and this and the sweetness of the Riesling cuts right through it all. So I, I like that one. I think those those three would be my well, they, they, they sound tantalizingly appealing. So, now I'm getting hungry. Oh, we are getting hungry now. <laughs> now, now. Now, talking about that, you know, Richard, my, my last question to you today, you've spent four decades of your life. You've been instrumental. You have, in many ways, have been like a catalyst and also the yeast to the fermentation of the, you know, the wine region that you are so closely associated with. How would you like to be remembered? I think first and foremost, I'd like to be re remembered as a good man, uh, a good husband, a good father. Um, uh, secondly, um, I'd like to be remembered as someone who helped get, get this region um, started and and developed and and one of the founders of our region and uh hopefully had helped do that and along the way helped preserve a lot of land that would otherwise not have gone into agriculture and has been preserved um and be a good community member as well so all of that um it's nice to think that some of the wines I've made will will still be here after I'm gone, hopefully, and they'll hopefully still taste good. Um, that's really uh, not easy to do, but yeah, essentially that. I mean, um, at the end of the day, it's really um, to me my my family and and the person that I am is more important. And the most important thing. So hopefully people remember me as someone who treated them well with kindness and uh, and love. And that's really all we can do and the best thing we can leave behind. And all we can ask for. But having said that, the pen is mightier than the sword. But uh, in today's world, we probably would say it's going to be the keyboard. And yes. for the audience, this book sun sea soil and wine that was written by richard is available and where can they find it richard uh it's at of course on amazon barnes and noble uh also uh, suny press which is the state state university of new york press who was gracious enough to publish this for me they also sell it directly um so any of those places hopefully uh um some some other smaller bookstores may be able to carry it but um oh. um the easiest ones of course are always amazon and barnes and noble um 
So all available online. We also have them at Bedell Sellers. If you wanted to buy them directly from us, I can autograph them. Uh, or if people have one they want to send to me, I can sign them and get it back to you. So, but uh, yeah. I'm very, very thankful for you um, having me on and and being interested and um, very appreciative of that. Can't thank you enough, Dr. Lee. It's been a pleasure having you, Richard. You're an extraordinary man. You have really set the pace and left your mark. And for that, it, it's been a privilege. And thank you very much for being on our show. And audience, if you, if you do get the chance, there's not many books that I would suggest, but this is truly a book, not just about the vineyard and about the area in, you know, North Fork of Long Island. It's about the... It's about the man. Something worth reading. Until Thank then, you. we'll see you at the next episode. Thank you once again, Richard, for being our guest. Thank you, Dr. Lynch. Bye -bye. Cheers. Thank you very much for watching our video. And if you liked our video, please like, share, comment, subscribe to our channel.